Welcome to this week's episode of Breaking History on Badlands Media. My name is Matthew Errett. My co-host, Sean Morgan, cannot make it this week, but he will be back next week. So I'm going to run this thing solo for today, and we'll see how it goes. Typically speaking, um, I like bouncing ideas off Sean, and so when I was asked to, to do a solo performance, I figured what I would do is something a little bit different and maybe a little bit more classroom-like. So I'd suggest... For those listening, pull out your notebooks. We're going to go into some lessons of history that have immediate application for our current situation. Um, and that is, I think, always the most important approach when thinking about history is not to, you know, study events on a timeline in the past, but rather think about what type of lessons can we learn to inform our decisions in the present as we chart out the future. And we are living, after all, in history. There will be future generations of historians who are not even born yet, looking back at the present crisis facing mankind and asking, did my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my ancestors make the right decisions? Did they make the wise decisions informed by their own past experience? Or did they hold on to delusions, folly, and lies and repeat a tragic error or or, or corrupt mistakes that led society so many times in the past into disaster. So I'm going to do a little screen share. We're going to show about, um, let's say about 20 or so slides. I'm going to do a few commercial breaks and we'll see if we can get through this in a uh, responsible amount of time. The presentation for today is called Hyperinflation, Fascism and War, How the New World Order Can Be Averted Once More. The idea of the New World Order is not a new one. The idea of, of trying to bring about a system of global enslavement under some romanticized feudalism where human beings are depopulated, live short lives, hard lives, where they don't own anything, and, uh, and are content with simplicity and uh, scarcity is something which has been desired for centuries, if, if not millennia, by leading factions within the, the, the oligarchy and these oligarchical families that have been holding on like a parasite to humanity for many, many centuries. And again, for anybody who wants to know more about some of the elements of how this works, I, I invite you to pick up my Anglo-Venetian Roots of the Deep State. Uh, that is volume four of the Clash of the Two Americas that'll take you through a bigger picture of this. So the, the important thing that I think is, is worth holding in mind is the question, why did they fail? At what points in time did the New World Order, some idea of a one world government under a master slave system of hereditary structures and institutions that preserve those types of um, imperial structures, when did they come close to manifesting in reality and how were they stopped? At what point did the oligarchy fail? And I think that that is the most important way for me personally to review history is looking at well, where did the oligarchy fail to achieve their desired agenda. Today's oligarchy has made their desired agenda very well known. Um, the figure of Klaus Schwab is somebody everyone has come to know very well um, as at least a front man for a broader operation which goes back in time and I think is far above uh, the head of even Klaus Schwab who himself is a cardboard cutout assigned to pull a certain task off. Um, as he was himself a student of one Henry Kissinger at a CIA-sponsored program in Harvard in the 1960s and was then assigned a certain task to set up things, something called the World Economic Forum in 1971. Now, Klaus Schwab, uh, Schwab recently said in his Dr. Evil outfit, I don't know if he said this while he was wearing the Dr. Evil outfit, is that the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies from education to social contracts and working conditions. Every country from the United States to China must participate and every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. Now, there's an element of truth in what he's saying, partially because those who he works for put a ball into motion that would ensure that capitalism, as we once knew it, as a viable, productive process that was associated with true democracy and freedom and uplifting people to a better standard of living would no longer be the common practice of what came out of the consumer society cult that was normalized with the 1970s. Um, so what is blowing up in our face right now is more of a time bomb masquerading as capitalism. And people could see 
For example, one good way of looking at the current crisis that largely really started blowing up or becoming um, something that people could look at in 2008 as a systemic crisis was the derivatives blowout. Uh, this is an overview published back in actually 19, uh, 2013 of an assessment of American banks and their exposure to derivatives. These are essentially um, securitized debts that have been bumbled, bun bumbled, bundled, insured upon, and speculated upon on the futures and uh, spot markets on Wall Street, which has become increasingly more of just a casino instead of a zone where productive investments could be made, as was once more the case. Not always perfect, but at least it was a, a, more, a more reasonable form of investment practice back in the 50s and early 60s. So what you see right there is about 708 uh, a billion, 708, sorry, trillion dollars in derivatives that are accounted for uh, overall. JP Morgan is the most exposed with nearly 90 trillion dollars of derivatives. Citibank, Bank of America, Wachovia, HSBC, and many others uh, should fall on, on the list. this list. Um, the world GDP is about 80 trillion. So we're still talking here about a tenfold, 10 times greater um, quantity of derivatives. This is the real time bomb. And if you think back in 1992, there was about $2 trillion worth of derivatives, outstanding debt contracts. And so when you hear that a bank has gone bankrupt and needs a bailout, what is being bailed, bailed out are largely the, the debt obligations associated with derivatives and themselves came about by the creation or the destruction of things like Glass-Steagall. The separation, the, the legal separation that once broke speculative banking a, apart from uh, commercial banking, useful banking um, that was tied to the real economy. There, we once had a, a wall saying that you could gamble, but you couldn't expect to be bailed out if you were a speculator who failed, as was the case after Bill Clinton destroyed Glass Steagall in 1999, resulting in massive amounts of, uh, of, of healthy assets being used as collateral to gamble in high risk otherwise known as junk bond markets that gave birth to things like the real estate bubble of subprime mortgages, which in fact never ended ever after the Dodd-Frank bill or the so-called banking reforms that we were told happened in 2010. None of that occurred. In fact, we're about to go into a phase of a new aspect of this blowout that involves an additional aspect of something called bail-ins, which maybe we'll, I'll say something about that later. A more important way of looking at the breakdown of the banking system is by looking at the uh, the fire economy. How once back in 19, if you go back to the 19 uh, mid 80s, there was a crossover where finance, insurance, real estate, rental, and leasing that component of the economy uh, crossed over um, with what is known as manufacturing factories, the real part of the productive economy. Which, if you go back to the post World War II age, this which is the much more important part of the economy amounted to over 28% of the overall GDP percentage wise compared to you know, a little over 10% for the so-called speculative aspect of the economy. Whereas by 2009, this is still a 14 year old map, this had increased to 21% of speculation versus 11% of productivity of, of things that are relatively measurable and it didn't get that much better. It, th these trends continued. Um, another way of looking at this is to observe the distribution of the labor force, where we could see clearly that the services sector was once about 50%. Today, it's upwards of, of 80%, whereas the ind industrial and agricultural sectors, which once amounted to almost 40% in the 1950s of, in of industry, uh, has, has been atrophied. So where one is, has collapsed, the other form of economy, the services base that's at the heart of the consumer society has increased. I, I think uh, the last two points are on science because the, the, the key thing is that if human beings are going to be able to avoid the, the idea that we're, if we're gonna be able to refute the idea that we are overpopulated, which is what people like Klaus Schwab and many of these Malthusians who are itching for world government and global depopulation, we have to be able to demonstrate that we can always leap beyond the limits to growth. One of the biggest drivers of this uh, ability to leap outside of the limits to growth in order to sustain more people at a higher standard of living by increasing the productive powers of labor of a nation are in the ability to make discoveries of the laws of the universe. 
um, and transform them, translate them into new technologies that did not exist with when when humanity was ignorant of those uh, later discovered laws. One of the zones that much of this these creative leaps occurred in was under uh, were made under the dynamic put into motion by John F. Kennedy, where we could see that um, the idea of the space program, out of which spun a variety of things, including the internet, uh, materials processing technologies, uh, many types of medical resources, and, and many other aspects of our lives that we take for granted came out of the pursuit of doing certain things um, regarding space exploration. This had actually peaked at its funding to about 4.5% in 1965, at which point it was slashed. Then the, the idea of NASA being the driver of the economy, tying human the human economy to the infinite discoverable properties of the universe that was slashed by design by those who were coming into power over the dead body of John F. Kennedy um, to the point that it resulted in going down to less than 0.5% where it was maintained for, for many, many years. Um, the other aspect of cutting edge science that I think is important to look at is the slashing of fusion research. We were always told that fusion is 30 years away. Well, and this demoralizes people because it's always 30 years away. Why is it always 30 years away? It's because it's being consciously sabotaged. Here are some investment strategies that were put forth in the early 1970s uh, by the US, by US congressmen who are trying to figure out how can we be best attain fusion. And that means funding it appropriately, giving scientists the resources that they require to build prototypes, to test their ideas out, which was not granted. And instead those same Malthusians, like I was saying, who took over, um, over the dead bodies of Bobby Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, the same Malthusians who put Klaus Schwab into power in 1971, who detached the U.S. dollar from the gold reserve uh, system of the fixed exchange rate in order to speculate upon the dollar and to use it as an instrument of economic warfare. These same operatives made sure that this domain of discovery into the power of that we could unlock in the atom was never attained. And as we see, the actual funding fell to a fraction of what was needed just for fusion, never for break even. Um, yeah, so there's there's this to keep in mind. Now to get back into the agenda, what took over? What were these Malthusians, the, those devotees and technocrats who believed that mankind was overpopulated and that the role of government must be designed to reduce human population and human impact on the environment? Well. Here's one figure of Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was a co-founder of the Trilateral Commission, working very closely with Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller, um, and many others who took control, especially during the 1970s. And Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote sort of the manifesto for the Trilateral Commission, known as the um, as a book. It was called Between Two Ages, America in the Technotronic Era, where he describes this in-between moment between human beings being in the the industrial era of nation states and progress and the post-industrial era, which would be the, the end of history era where we would have one world government, no more nation states. And this period in between that he was ushering in with the trilateral takeover of America, he called the, the between era. And what was this, this technotronic between era? He describes it, he says that the technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite, unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. Very, very super villainy, but this is the, the type of psychology that we're dealing with because what can they do if they have the, the, the data of everybody's consumptive beha behaviors, what are they feeling at different moments? This is effectively the type of world that was discussed in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World or in or, or, uh, Orwell's 1984, which are not warnings, by the way, these are blueprints. Another character who worked very closely with his big new Brzezinski was a figure named Samuel P. Huntington. He wrote a, a book on behalf of the Trilateral Commission called The Crisis in Democracy, which ushered in the guideline of how the CIA was, was to reform or rebrand their operations internationally from being a direct regime change policy towards using um, semi-private and semi-public 
groups like the National Endowment for Democracy as cover organizations to enforce regime change through what, it, what became known as color revolution. And in his book on the crisis of democracy, Huntington, again, working with Zbigniew Brzezinski, and this was unveiled in a trilateral meeting in Japan in 1975. He says, we have come to recognize that there are potential desirable limits to economic growth. There are also potentially desirable limits to the indefinite extension of democracy. A government which lack authority will have little ability to impose on its people the sacrifices that will be necessary. So what are these sacrifices that he demands that governments impose as instruments of the will of the elite class that demands, um, de you know, <laughs> that we obey our limits to growth, that, that the idea of economic growth be limited? How are they thinking? Well, let's, this takes us to, I think, the third and final uh, quote that I find useful just to paint the picture of the psychology of the enemy is a figure who Klaus Schwab called his mentor, a Canadian a devotee of the Rockefeller agenda who uh, is known as Maury Strong, uh, one of the godfathers of what became known as the Green New Deal and the Great Reset, who co-founded and was a director of the World Economic Forum for many, many years. He died in 2015, but unfortunately his insipid ideas still exist. And he wrote uh, musingly, in, or he gave an interview in 1990, saying, well, what if a small group of world leaders were to conclude that the principal risk to the earth comes from the actions of the rich, rich countries? And if the world is to survive, those rich countries would have to sign an agreement reducing their impact on the environment. Will they do it? The group's conclusion is no. The rich countries won't do it. They won't change. So in order to save the planet, the group decides, isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? Well, that's horrific. And keep in mind, in the scenario for West Magazine that he was recounting uh, in this interview, he's, he's actually situating the scenario in a meeting at Davos that he presided over. He would go on to write things, draft things like the Earth Charter to replace the UN Charter, get rid of nation states, and bring about this idea of an Agenda 21, which became Agenda 2030, all sort of... Uh, the product of the efforts made by Maury Strong and his Trilateral Commission friends. Stephen Rockefeller um, was a key figure within the uh, the Earth Charter um, program that, that documented and drafted this thing, as was Mikhail Gorbachev, who was in the midst of fulfilling his role in the New World Order of dismantling Russia, as he did in 1992, and working very closely with Maury Strong the entire time. So now what's, what I'm going to do is take a little step back. We're going to look at some advertisements uh, or listen to some advertisements, and then we'll get back to the next segment of this broadcast. Are you self-employed and shouldering hefty insurance costs? The cost of medical insurance can often be like a second mortgage payment. You might be tempted to cut corners, but Obamacare coverage will leave you with unlimited liability in the event of a large claim. MediShare plans are not insurance. They can leave you responsible for other people's claims. Fortunately, there is a solution. For over 30 years, David Becker and Mid-Atlantic Business Alliance has been helping self-employed individuals save money and get better insurance. If you don't have a PPO, you don't have protection. At least not full protection. Mid-Atlantic Business Alliance specializes in providing top-of-the-line PPO coverage for at, at affordable group rates. If you are paying for your own medical insurance, give David a call at 609-577-8557. There are proven ways to substantially reduce your costs without sacrificing coverage. Call Mid-Atlantic Business Alliance to see if they can help. 5280 Distilling is a great new Badlands sponsor. Founded and run by three friends from Littleton, Colorado, this is a family business. The team at 5280 went to school together, played sports together, and worked together in this spirited endeavor. Hmm, I like the pun. 5280 Distilling uses innovative distilling techniques, fresh and organic ingredients, and crisp Rocky Mountain water to produce excellent distilled spirits. Colorado water is a legit game changer, but it's not just the water. You can taste 5280's passion in every sip. Let's talk about a couple of these spirits. 
Their Cackler's Whiskey blends traditional bourbon and 5280 mellows the spice by combining traditionally aged bourbon with accelerated aged rye bourbons for a refined taste. This exceptionally smooth bourbon style whiskey hints of sweet honey and light smoke with a very mellow finish. Then there is the Hearthstone Irish Whiskey and in this one 5280 combines new and old world traditions blending a three-year-old Irish whiskey and rye whiskies, bringing forth a surprisingly sweet floral fragrance with hints of toasted oak and vanilla. These incredible products and many others can be shipped to 34 states, so check the website to see about the availabilities. 5280 Distilling is offering free shipping for purchases over $95, and that's a great deal considering that these glass bottles are heavy and the Biden supply chain crisis has sent shipping costs to the moon. You can also get a 10% off of your order at 5280distilling.com by using the promo code BADLANDS. That's 5280distilling.com, promo code BADLANDS. All right, we are back. So <clears throat> now let's return to our story. This process of a controlled disintegration of the economy as Paul Volcker himself, Trilateral Commission member, head, guy who headed the Federal Reserve, called for the controlled dis, dis, uh, disintegration of society back in 1980 when he was in the midst of jacking up the interest, price, uh, interest rates to 20% or more for two years or more, destroying and wiping out a big chunk of the small and medium enterprises, mom and pop shops of North America as a whole, and hurting much of the world, including the dev developing sector. Um, this act was done as part of what he exactly called for as a controlled demolition of the economy. This is what Maury Strong called for. This is what Klaus Schwab was a part of and it was overseeing for the past 50 years. This is what King, King Charles III has been a part of as well um, in order to bring about this new green ethos of a green new deal and a world that values or monetizes only those investment activities that are tied to actions which reduce the human impact on the environment by bringing about uh carbon restrictions you know green zones of uh of windmills and solar panels but things that won't allow us to industrialize that will force new contraction of the world population this is similar to something that was done by design in 1919 at the end of world war one and for those who don't know this is known as the treaty of versailles which was a design destruction of germany as a whole and the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, but specifically Germany, which had formerly been one of the economic and cultural powerhouses of the world and uh, had worked very closely with allies in Russia as well as within America in the 19th century in order to create a new type of system of national economic cooperation and win-win development based on protectionism, large-scale economic uh, productive credit emissions, as Lincoln had done in his time, and as Bismarck had done after the customs union was set up called the Zollverein, with allies in France and allies in Germany and beyond, even in the Ottoman Empire, which had a plan for the Berlin to Baghdad Railway uh, as a way to modernize and break these nations free of the shipping monopolies of the British Empire, which, keep in mind, has been the center of evil for the past several centuries and uh, could only control the world through the city of London centralization of finance and the dependency of nations on maritime shipping, which Britain effectively monopolized. So what had happened after World War I? And keep in mind, World War I was initiated by the British Empire, utilizing anarchist terrorist cells like the Black Hand in Serbia that killed a disposable archduke and that ushered in a, a chain or activated a chain of secret military agreements that predictably resulted in a meat grinder for four years. Now, the roundtable movement of, of the Milner Group that took control of Britain in 1916 and was doing the same thing over the, in the United States um, ensured some major destructive things for Germany. Number one was that 132 billion gold marks must be repaid, territorial loss representing 10% of the population, Alsace-Lorraine, Ruhr, North, uh, North Silesia would be taken control of over by the Victor, Victor nations, 15% of the arable land would be taken away from Germany, 74% of its iron ore production would be removed, 8,000 locomotives and 225,000 rail cars would be taken, um, and the dismantling completely of any defensive systems for Germany. So by forcing these impossibly high debt repayments, 
and destroying the means of production that would have given value to the, the, the currency in circulation in Germany, the Reichsmarks quickly lost all value as only the only option available to pay the debt was printing money. The printing of the money resulted in, as we see, a momentary respite, but quickly took off to the point that by mid-1923, or 20, yeah, 23, billion, tens of billions of dollars were going around rep being represented by one bill. People were, as we could see, playing with these things. Billions and billions of, of Reichsmarks were being toyed with, like games were being burnt to keep warm. And this gentleman there with the wheelbarrow was probably going off to buy a loaf of bread. There was resistance. Um, when you look at some of the people who ensured that the League of Nations, which was also created the, at the the the, 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 the conference of, at Versailles in Paris, you had the League of Nations also created at this time as the basis of a one world government with the idea that, look, nation states, by tolerating nation states, we had World War I. If we just got rid of nation states, we will have no more war and we, were, we will have a world of peace, we were told by these globalists who, were making, who had made the war happen to begin with. But the reason why the League of Nations failed at succeeding, successfully becoming that one world government was due to the sacrifices and battles made by people like President Warren Harding, um, who had organized bilateral agreements with other leaders of Germany, of Russia, of China. Uh, you had pe here people at the bottom, uh, well, you had uh, Russia represented by Georgi Chichorin, who was a foreign minister who worked with Kurt von Schleicher, bottom right, the foreign minister of Germany, to ensure that the Apollo a treaty that would erase the Versailles Treaty debts um, and create a industrial cooperative policy between Russia and Germany would be ha would happen instead. This is something which nearly occurred and, and Warren Harding played a role in this. It was sabotaged largely because Kurt von Schleicher was assassinated and his assistant was purged. Uh, this is, sorry, Kurt von Schleicher is this guy in the bottom left, Walter Rathenhau is the actual foreign minister, I should have said, who was the uh, the key orchestrator of this treat, of this Rapallo Accord. But despite that, you had primarily the United States unwilling to abrogate its sovereignty due to the patriots from both Republican and Democratic parties working with people like Harding, who asserted the role of the nation state to make the final decision about what happens on military, economic, or other policy. Um, what we have here is a... Um, a time bomb is set as well at the United States. The US had to thus be crushed and brought into a line. So how was the Great Depression created? Well, just like we have derivatives that were built up as a time bomb, so then did you have broker call loans? And that was that sec securities brokers gambling on Wall Street were allowed to take loans out to gamble with money that wasn't their own beyond their ability to pay. And by 1925, this had achieved $1.5 billion, but by 1927, it had risen to $5.7 about four times the actual value of the entire Wall Street uh, markets combined. And none of the brokers who were highly indebted, gambling with other people's money, had any way to pay any of those debts that they had taken out to gamble. This had also happened under um, Coolidge, um, who uh, relied upon Andrew Mellon, his treasury secretary, to oversee a massive free trade deregulation of the banking system. All of the protective tariffs that Warren Harding had brought about were all crushed and speculation was rampant. Um, the final Great Depression that blew out was caused by a coordinated broker call loan. So the pinprick was selected at a certain moment in 1929 when the bubble was sufficiently large where all the, the broker call loans were called in on the same day at the same moment. And this is where you had defaults. And it was known that the defaults were going to cause the chain reaction deleveraging of the banking system. Um, for those in the know who were part of the JP Morgan preferred clients list who understood that this was going to be a controlled demolition, they were able to sell their stocks early before the blowout. And then we saw that one of the biggest wealth transfers in history, kind of like what has been seen in more recent years by Vanguard, BlackRock and others in the know. Um, these are just some cartoons of the 1920s during the Great Depression, just showcasing the horrors of destruction. And it's not like this wasn't known. Um, you know, you had leading senators, congressmen. Uh, who were showcasing things like this in Congress uh, of the Wall Street control of international banking corporations, front shell companies, and other things. Um, I'm going to be running through this faster because I'm realizing that the content I want to go through is probably more than the show uh, allows. So I'm going to see what I can do. This would have turned into a uh, second 
more successful attempt at a one world government under the League of Nations and the Bank of International Settlements, which was cre- had been created in 1930 as the central bank of central banks, um, except for the fact that you had an unexpected dark horse that was able to emerge onto the scene as the head of the Democratic Party, who was able to restore, as he says, the um, policies of Abraham Lincoln, which unfortunately, since the death of Harding, had fallen out of practice in the Republican Party. So both parties were had both traitors as well as patriots within them, and these patriots worked together to resist the, um, um, the what I guess you could call it the deep state, a British-directed deep state. Franklin Roosevelt gave in his, in his inaugural speech um, a a series of remarks where he made the point that the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We now, may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. The measure of the restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. Now, what did Roosevelt exactly do? Well, number one, he sabotaged the one world government conference called the London Economic and Monetary Conference of 1933, which saw 65 countries Uh, brought together under the banner of the British Empire in London to create a new new fabric, a new set of rules for a one world banker's dictatorship as a way to solve the global Great Depression. The only reason why that did not succeed at the time that it did is because Franklin Roosevelt demanded that all the US, that the US delegations not participate in any of the activities when he came into office, ensuring that one of the most powerful nations economically at the time would not give the support to this new uh, post-nation state structure. And that torpedoed the conference. It became a failure. It disintegrated, didn't happen again for a number of years. So Roosevelt did avoid an assassination attempt when it was realized that he was about to sabotage this London conference. It was called the 19 or February 1933 assassination attempt using a Italian Freemasonic anarchist named Giuseppe Zangara, who shot five times, killed the mayor of Chicago, Cermak, who was standing next to Roosevelt. And this was only because a woman in the audience saw the gun and hit his hand, causing him to misfire. Um, Roosevelt survived. Mayor Cermak died. And again, in 1934, uh, luckily, General Smedley Butler blew the whistle on the banker's coup, the business coup run by J.P. Morgan and J.P. Morgan Assets, who wanted to use him as a hero of the military in order to install a military junta, a, a fascist dictatorship with him as a puppet dictator, which he then went to, he, he basically filmed himself and had that projected into national cinemas all over the United States, documenting exactly how the Wall Street faction that we know now today was funding Hitler, was bankrolling the growth of fascism, of Nazism. That's the, the, you know, I'm here referring to the George Bush clan, the DuPonts, the Morgans, even the Rockefellers and Standard Oil, who were pouring resources into the growth of fascism as the new approach to a new world order. So again, a second time that the new world order was sabotaged in a number of years. Again, caused by primarily heroes and patriots in America. The war on Wall Street was then also launched by Franklin Roosevelt and a certain grouping within his administration. And I don't say the whole thing because there were also vipers and traitors there too, just like around Trump. There was good people and a lot of vipers and traitors. You had Glass-Steagall, the bank separation that broke up the banks. We talked about that at the beginning. We have the Pecora Commission where Roosevelt gave special powers to Ferdinand Pecora to subpoena bankers like J.P. Morgan Jr., bring him to court and demonstrate why these bankers were able to initiate and orchestrate the Great Depression itself and conduct a variety of other scams. Um, Hundreds of bankers of Wall Street went to jail over this process and the population was informed about how their banks were manipulated. We had bankruptcy reorganization under effectively Chapter 11, the creation of the FDIC that gave um, an insurance of protection to investors up to $100,000 at the time, which was a lot of money, still is, but this was a given as a protection for anybody who had savings that needed to be saved. I mean, you got to keep in mind something like uh, 7,000 banks went under under short order during this period. And so um, during the two-week bankruptcy bank holiday, you had a reorganization to see, well, which banks were valid, which ones were not solvent. And about 75% were reorganized under new management and new economic behavior became enforced by the new banks that were not put, uh, that basically were not uh, completely closed down. 
Now, the idea of value was no longer tied to speculation, but rather tied to what are you investing in the real economy? So we have things like also the, the Security Exchange Commission on Wall Street we, th that began for the first time to oversee the behavior of Wall Street banks. We had the industrialist, uh, uh, somebody who really supported an industrial renaissance of America named Mariner Eccles, as, as instituted as Federal Reserve Chair, forcing for the first time the Federal Reserve to start obeying some form of government regulation. We had the alternative lending mechanisms outside of the Federal Reserve control through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which acted effectively like a national bank. And we had a lot of protectionism. That's a very important part. Donald Trump also made the point of protectionism being the basis of any sovereign nation, which is when, you know, this is the, at the heart of the fight against NAFTA. From 1933 to 39, there were 45,000 infrastructure projects built, big and small. The four quarters macro projects are kind of like a, an American variation of the Belt and Road Initiative with the Tennessee Valley Authority being one zone of major investment. We had the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Grand Coulee Dam, as well as the Hoover Dam, but many other projects in between. Um, you have the te Tennessee Valley area went from Beverly Hillbilly racist backwards illiteracy, where only 20% of the population there were literate in 1932, to 80% illiteracy in 1950. And keep in mind, the Tennessee area and all of the South became industrial advanced aerospace zones due to the abundance of hydroelectric electricity that allowed that made creating aluminum and other things much more viable economically. Franklin Roosevelt had a view for the foreign, for the post-war world as well, which did, did not involve imperialism. This is a look of Frank of Churchill uh, looking on in horror as Roosevelt is telling some joke to Stalin. Stalin and, and Churchill say what you like about Stalin, or you know, there's a lot of reasons to criticize him, but overall, um, he did avoid several assassination attempts and had his own deep state run by. Uh, fascists, Nazi loyalists, and British agents inside of Russia as well under the Trotskyist networks. Um, and he and Roosevelt got along pretty well because both of them knew that they had these fifth columnists and deep state operatives working within their midst on behalf of the old nobility and oligarchy centered in London. Roosevelt had made it very clear that, um, that he would not protect the British or Dutch or French or Belgium or other empires after the war. But before I say anything more about that, let's go into another commercial break to have a listen to what are what the sponsors of Badlands Media are doing. In the fast paced world we live in, ensuring the health and vitality of our brain is paramount. We've seen and discussed the strains placed on our minds in the modern era. Today, I want to shed light on a simple yet profound way to elevate your brain's health. Omega-3s, we've heard of them, haven't we? These aren't just fats, they are essential components of every neuron in our brain. When omega-3s are in play, our neurons communicate more efficiently. These powerful molecules not only bolster our brain's integrity, but also supercharge its performance. And the benefits don't stop there from supporting mental development and preserving long-term cognitive functions to promoting heart health, clear vision, and balanced hormones, omega-3s are the unsung heroes of our health. Now, when most of us hear omega-3s, we immediately think fish oil. Let me let you in on a secret. Fish get their omega-3s from algae, making it the primary source. Ascent Nutrition taps directly into this, presenting their omega-3 algae oil DHA. And here's the twist. Ascent Nutrition has just launched their lemon-flavored algae oil DHA. It's perfect for everyone, man, woman, young, old. It's nature's goodness bottled up for all. Ready to boost your brain and overall health? Visit AscentBadlands.com. And use the code BADLANDS to grab a cool 10% off on not just the omega-3 algae oil DHA, but their range of mushrooms, coffee, and other wellness products. Just click the link in the description or head straight to AscentBadlands.com. Prioritize your health, embrace the natural power of algae, and let Ascent Nutrition be your guide to a brighter, healthier tomorrow. As we usher in 2023, the first harvest from Benson Honey Farms has just graced our presence capturing the very soul of America's heartland. 
From a quaint corner in Nebraska, Benson Honey Farms offers you a purity seldom found. Their honey is raw, unpasteurized, 100% natural, a result of tireless bees embracing the wildflower fields. This is the flavor of Badland, rich and untamed. Adding depth to your meals, Benson's smoky barbecue sauce, melded with the sweetness of their own honey, embodies the essence of a heartland gathering. It's the tradition of the grill refined. And for those with a penchant for sweetness, Benson's honey-drenched candies encapsulate Nebraska in every day. Now, to the loyal hearts of Badlands, Benson Honey Farms brings forth a special gesture. Venture to BensonHoneyFarms.com for your purchase and utilize the rep code Badlands. It's not just a code, it's an invitation to participate in the legacy of Nebraska delivered directly to you. Benson Honey Farms isn't just about produce. It's a testament to the America First ethos, representing the tenacity of our great nation. Echoing the Badland spirit, their family-driven venture serves as a beacon, emphasizing that the essence of America resonates from its heartland. So Badlanders, when the quest is for authenticity, for a taste that's unapologetically American, your compass should point towards Benson Honey Farms. Benson Honey Farms, an epitome of American pride and nature's bounty. Head to BensonHoneyFarms.com and with the Badlands rep code, bring forth the authentic taste of America's heartland. All right, welcome back to our, uh, our breaking history show where I'm just in the final leg of of our history lesson on how the new world order can be avoided once more, how it can be defeated once more, making the point where the lesson has been, how have patriots organized themselves around what policies and what conceptions of political economy and security and self-interest such that the one world government of a, of a eugenics based pro, uh, transhumanist ideology for a master slave society has been disrupted, avoided successfully in the past, such that we can learn how to do this again. So I brought up last, um, before the commercial break, how Franklin Roosevelt um, had a certain vision with his network of collaborators around the world about a, wor a, a world liberated from the institutions of practices of imperialism something that's been largely written out of our textbooks and even people who tend to like Roosevelt like him for all the wrong reasons because they don't understand actually what he is. And they just like the idea, for example, a lot of the Democrats around Obama or Biden might say something nice about Roosevelt, but they're only doing it basically because they want to be fascists. And they like the idea of the fact that Roosevelt used government to get things done, but they don't like the fact that his New Deal is very different from the type of Green New Deal that they've been trying to bring online. Whereas the Roosevelt New Deal, as we pointed out in our previous slides, was tied to increasing the bounty and abundance of mankind, increasing the productive powers of labor, increasing the means of supporting more people at a higher quality of life. Whereas the Green New Deal is tied, it's, it's essentially a doppelganger. It's, it's the very opposite inversion of all of those things that I just said, where the idea will be to monetize or make financial incentives around activities and business practices, which reduce human impact on the environment by, re, by shutting down carbon dioxide, which we breathe, by the way. This is something which also is produced by factories. And, um, and this is done under the guise of carbon footprints. So when they say we want to reduce the carbon footprints or the impact on the environment, they're actually saying depopulation under another uh, language. There's a book written by Roosevelt's son, Elliot, who was his, um, his assistant, who was there at Yalta at a lot of these accords and recorded in a book called As He Saw It in 1946, which people can read online. I highly recommend reading it. Various fights that Roosevelt, his father, had with uh, Churchill. And um, in one po point, Roosevelt makes the point when talking to his son after a long night of battles with Churchill, who Churchill's job was to preserve the British Empire, of course, or try to create a, an Anglo-American special relationship, Roosevelt says, I'm talking about another war, Elliot. I'm talking about what will happen to our world if after this war we allow millions of people to slide back into the same semi-slavery. Don't think for a moment, Elliot, that Americans would be dying in the Pacific tonight if it had, hadn't been for the short-sighted greed of the French and the British and the Dutch. Shall we allow them to do it all over again? 
your son will be about, about the right age, 15 or 20 years from now. One sentence, Elliot, and then I'm going to kick you out of here. It was very late at night. I'm tired. This is the sentence. When we've done, won the war, I will work with all my might and main to see to it that the United States is not wheedled into the position of accepting any plan that will further France's imperialistic ambitions or that will aid or abet the British Empire in its imperial ambitions. There's a lot more that, that is recounted by Eliot, but keep in mind that the array of what are called international New Dealers, it was not simply a domestic policy, the New Deal, but there was a international battle over uh, organizing leaders of, of former colonies of Africa, nations that, or, that were then still colonies, uh, seeking independence. Um, Africa, South America, Asia, and abroad. And you had people like Harry Hopkins, one of the closest confidants and advisors of Franklin Roosevelt, upper left with Stalin. You have Sumner Wells. Um, you have Wendell Wilkie, who's there with Chiang Kai-shek and Stalin. Uh, in the middle, you've got Sumner Wells, upper right-hand side, and undersecretary of state. Um, you got Harry Wallace, uh, Henry Wallace, the vice president, former agricultural minister of uh, the United States, and you have Harry Dexter White, the, the figure who led the American delegation at Bretton Woods in 1944 against John Maynard Keynes and the British imperialist faction who themselves wanted uh, as a solution for the basis of a new monetary structure after the war, something based on the Bancor, a Bank of England controlled common basis of trade or currency reserves that, that all nations would be forced to um, be sucked into, run by the bankers of London. Harry Dexter White was opposed to this Maynard Keynes idea, and he was opposed to Maynard, John Maynard Keynes's concept of mathematical equilibrium to enforce as, as a supranational entity from above um, a structure of 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 limits onto nations that would not be allowed to get into a, a certain amount of debt beyond their ability to in, invest. So there was an idea that your your surplus um, would always be balanced by what the deficits of every nation. And there was this idea of an absolute stasis that was seen as a good ideal for all nations to be locked into under Keynes's formula. And the international New Dealers, especially uh, Dexter White at this conference, recognized that no, because human beings can create abundance. We, are, we shouldn't be bounded by math mathematical formulae. And this is why John Maynard Keynes thought that Roosevelt was an economic incompetent, hated Roosevelt, said so in writing, and why Roosevelt thought that John Maynard Keynes was a fetish, a mathematical fetishist and not an, a political economist, and said so in writing. And we've been lied to by historians who are working for the CFR and other things to try to convince us that Roosevelt was a Keynesian. It's the same lie that was painted to try to paint the American founding fathers as if they were all followers of British imperialist racist a disgusting Satanist like John Locke or um, Adam Smith, even for that matter, which is not the case at all. And the leading founding fathers were in total opposition of, to the British imperial school of political economists, were not inspired by it, even though we are told the opposite in our history books today for a reason. So this unfortunately is something which was successful as a battle. The British delegations did not succeed in coming out with a one world bankers dictatorship for the third attempt, even though their, their Hitler Frankenstein machine failed as it blew up in their face when Hitler realized that he could be the senior partner of a one world government of a new world order instead of a junior partner as the British had desired. Um, and they had to re basically flush their, uh, their, their aborted attempt uh, utilizing the Hitler and, and Italian fascist machinery, but they didn't give up. And they, they learned basically that they could reorganize and fight a longer game. And this is where Roosevelt having died a little bit too early, uh, Stalin always did believe and said so publicly, this was poisoning by Churchill's gang. Uh, but when Roosevelt died, his leading allies died, Wendell Wilkie died, uh, uh, Hopkins died, Sumner Wells was uh, kicked out of government, Wallace was labeled a red commie, so was Harry Dexter White, who also died under mysterious circumstances in 1948 while campaigning for Wallace, uh, who was then running as a third party uh, progressive, so-called progressive, but I mean, it's the idea was labor, um, against the idea of creating a cold war um, and restoring Roosevelt's vision for the world, but that didn't succeed. The FBI operation worked very hard to dismantle that from within, and a lot of the greatest patriots of America who fought to stop this one world government on so many occasions were purged from the government, were purged from intelligence with the destruction of the OSS, 
and then only the, the worst traitorous elements were reconstituted with the CIA, which became an instrument for the British, not even American, operation under the Five Eyes, or what was known as the UK-USA Signals Agreement, overseen by Churchill the same day that he created the Cold War and the Iron Curtain speech. So this is where the takeover of America really got underway under a longer game, and although Eisenhower tried warning about this foreign entity and the rise of the military-industrial complex, it still grew and grew and grew, and John F. Kennedy was probably the brightest shining light who tried to revive uh, Franklin Roosevelt's vision. This is the last slide that we'll end on, where he, re where he gave a speech in 1962 saying that we, the USA and Europe, both believe in the achievement of social justice and in progress for all our people. He is not referring to wokeism, BLM, Antifa, social justice. This is real justice for society. It's a different idea, so don't get caught off by words. We believe in democracy, and he doesn't mean Biden democracy either. Don't get cut off by words. He means legitimate rule by the people, by, of, and for the people. We both believe in democracy at what Americans call the grassroots, placing the individual ahead of the state, the community ahead of the party, and public interests ahead of private. During the 1930s, when dis despair and depression opened wide, gate, opened wide the gates of many nations to fascism and communism, my own nation adhered to the course of freedom under the leadership of Franklin Roosevelt. His administration introduced a higher degree of social, economic, and political reform than America had previously seen, including tax and budget reforms, land and agricultural reforms, political and institutional reforms. Workers were assured of a decent wage. Older citizens were assured of a pension. Farmers were assured of a fair price. That's the parity pricing idea. Work, working men and women were permitted to organize and bargain collectively. Small businessmen, small investors, and small depositors to banks, thanks to the Glass-Steagall law, were given greater protection against the evils of both corruption and depression. Farms were electrified, rivers were harnessed, cooperatives were encouraged. Justice, social and economic justice, as well as legal, became increasingly the right and the opportunity of every man, regardless of his means or station in life. This brings us to the end of the broadcast uh, today. I really wanted to just get across that even though the light that, that JFK represented was snuffed out as far as his mortal body, the policies that he awoke once again, that reflected the principles of the New Deal in a, in a more modern fashion in the 1960s through his dozens of hydroelectric dams, the ushering in of productive investments with the, uh, with the collaboration of the private and public sector, but done not in such a manner that the private sector of the corporations were running the government, but rather were simply the assistance to supportive of the, the broader vision of the government, which is not something other, as JFK understood and expressed, it's not something other than the people. We are the government and we represent what the, our will, our desire, our consent and our well-being defines the behavior of what government should be allowed to do or not as far as the representatives selected by and of the people to carry out a mission, a task. And they must be held accountable when they abrogate such responsibilities. And that's upon each of us, not just simply to vote once in a blue moon, but rather to be constant day to day, every single day of our lives, activist citizens, the idea of the citizen soldier, which Samuel P. Huntington fought and subverted by, by bringing in the idea of the mercenary class, obedient, uh, obedient uh, private soldier, the, 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 that idea of the soldier in the state, which was the heart of the, re the revolution in military affairs that made things like 9-11, like the, the absurd wars in Iraq and the never ending wars possible. This is something which JFK resisted and that example that he gave and the example that Franklin Roosevelt had given earlier by demonstrating how do you properly do battle utilizing the, the instruments of the sovereign nation state as a power against the feudal globalists and the death cultists who want to reduce human activity. This is something that we must learn from today because I can guarantee you there are nations of this world who are doing this battle, who have done battle with their deep state operations and traitors within their midst. Um, in a much better degree than we here in the transatlantic have done. And here, of course, I'm referring to those nations that we've spoken about with in previous episodes from the multipolar alliance who are saying no to depopulation and would rather work with us as allies and partners rather than go to war. Um, but this is really is up to us here in the West to see if we have the ability to get our collective heads out of our asses and organize appropriately to ensure that we have a sense of 
future orientation and we can use and demand that our representatives and ourselves become even elected representatives if possible and that we use the right to protectionism, the right to a national bank, the right to emit credit for large scale projects, the right to invest in things that will be tied to leaping beyond the limits to growth. Because the universe is a big place and we haven't discovered much of it, but we do know that we are the only species who have demonstrated a capability of uh, avoiding, of doing something about imminent asteroid impacts or the fact that the sun, we can understand how the sun cycles can be destructive, can usher in ice ages, which have resulted in about 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever exist to no longer be here today through forces that have nothing to do with SUVs or carbon dioxide, but what the galaxy does as a whole. So we can, we can choose to think on a much broader level or we can think in a myopic short-term way and be victims. It's our choice, but that's pretty much it. So next week we will be back with Sean Morgan for another episode of Breaking History on Badlands Media. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, talk to everybody next week.